Hello friends and welcome to tonight's sleep story. I will be reading for you three stories by Beatrix Potter. The Tale of Jemima Puddle Duck, The Tale of Mrs. Tiggy Winkle, as well as The Tale of Mr. Jeremy Fisher. If you enjoy these stories, I would encourage you to subscribe, so you will be notified of upcoming sleep stories. It is time to unwind. Find a place where you can relax. Once you are settled in, take a deep breath. And now, that you're ready to relax, let us begin these stories. The Tale of Jemima Puddle Duck What a funny sight it is to see a brood of ducklings with a hen. Listen to the story of Jemima Puddle Duck, who was annoyed because the farmer's wife would not let her hatch her own eggs. Her sister-in-law, Mrs. Rebecca Puddleduck, was perfectly willing to leave the hatching to someone else. I have not the patience to sit on a nest for twenty-eight days. And no more have you, Jemima. You would let them go cold. You know you would. I wish to hatch my own eggs. I will hatch them all by myself quacked Jemima Puddle Duck. She tried to hide her eggs, but they were always found and carried off. Jemima Puddle Duck became quite desperate. She determined to make a nest right away from the farm. She set off on a fine spring afternoon along the cart road that leads over the hill. She was wearing a shawl and a poke bonnet. When she reached the top of the hill, she saw a wood in the distance. She thought that it looked a safe, quiet spot. Jemima Puddle Duck was not much in the habit of flying. She ran downhill, a few yards flapping her shawl, and then she jumped off into the air. She flew beautifully when she had got a good start. She skimmed along over the treetops until she saw an open place in the middle of the wood, where the trees and brushwood had been cleared. Jemima alighted rather heavily and began to waddle about in search of a convenient dry nesting place. She rather fancied a tree stump amongst some tall fox cloth. But seated upon the stump, she was startled to find an elegantly dressed gentleman reading a newspaper. He had black prick ears and sandy colored whiskers. Quack, said Jemima Puddle Duck, with her head and her bonnet on one side. Quack. The gentleman raised his eyes above his newspaper and looked curiously at Jemima. Madame, have you lost your way? said he. He had a long bushy tail which he was sitting upon, as the stump was somewhat damp. Jemima thought him mighty civil and handsome. She explained that she had not lost her way but that she was trying to find a convenient dry nesting place. Ah, is that so, indeed, said the gentleman with sandy whiskers, looking curiously at Jemima. He folded up the newspaper and put it in his coat-tail pocket. Jemima complained of the superfluous hen. Indeed. How interesting! I wish I could meet with that fowl. I would teach it to mind its own business. 
But as to a nest, there is no difficulty. I have a sackful of feathers in my woodshed. No, my dear madam, you will be in nobody's way. You may sit there as long as you like, said the bushy, long-tailed gentleman. He led the way to a very retired, dismal-looking house, amongst the foxgloves. It was built of faggots and turf, and there were two broken pails, one on top of another, by way of a chimney. This is my summer residence. You would not find my earth, my winter house, so convenient said the hospitable gentleman. There was a tumble-down shed at the back of the house, made of old soap boxes. The gentleman opened the door and showed Jemima in. The shed was almost quite full of feathers. It was almost suffocating, but it was comfortable and very soft. Jemima Puddle Duck was rather surprised to find such a vast quantity of feathers. But it was very comfortable, and she made a nest without any trouble at all. When she came out, the sandy whiskered gentleman was sitting on a log reading the newspaper. At least he had it spread out, but he was looking over the top of it. He was so polite that he seemed almost sorry to let Jemima go home for the night. He promised to take great care of the nest until she came back again next day. He said he loved eggs and ducklings. He should be proud to see a fine nestful in his woodshed. Jemima Puddle Duck came every afternoon. She laid nine eggs in the nest. They were greeny-white and very large. The foxy gentleman admired them immensely. He used to turn them over and count them when Jemima was not there. At last Jemima told him that she intended to begin to sit next day. And I will bring a bag of corn with me, so that I need never leave my nest until the eggs are hatched. They might catch cold, said the conscientious Jemima. Madame, I beg you not to trouble yourself with a bag. I will provide oats. But before you commence your tedious sitting, I intend to give you a treat. Let us have a dinner party all to ourselves. May I ask you to bring up some herbs from the farm garden to make a savory omelette? Sage and thyme and mint and two onions and some parsley. I will provide lard for the stuff, lard for the omelette, said the hospitable gentleman with sandy whiskers. Jemima Puddle Duck was a simpleton. Not even the mention of sage and onions made her suspicious. She went round the farm garden, nibbling off snippets of all the different sorts of herbs that are used for stuffing roast duck. And she waddled into the kitchen and got two onions out of her basket. The collie dog, Cap, met her coming out. What are you doing with those onions? Where do you go every afternoon by yourself, Jemima Puddle Duck? Jemima was rather in awe of the collie. She told him the whole story. The collie listened with his wise head on one side. He grinned when she described the polite gentleman with sandy whiskers. He asked several questions about the wood and about the exact position of the house and shed. Then he went out and trotted down the village. He went to look for two foxhound puppies, who were out at walk with the butcher. Jemima Puddle Duck went up the cart road for the last time 
on a sunny afternoon. She was rather burdened with bunches of herbs and two onions in a bag. She flew over the wood and alighted opposite the house of the bushy, long-tailed gentleman. He was sitting on a log. He sniffed the air and kept glancing uneasily round the wood. When Jemima alighted, he quite jumped. Come into the house as soon as you have looked at your eggs. Give me the herbs for the omelette. Be sharp. He was rather abrupt. Jemima Puddle Duck had never heard him speak like that. She felt surprised and uncomfortable. While she was inside, she heard pattering feet round the back of the shed. Someone with a black nose sniffed at the bottom of the door and then locked it. Jemima became much alarmed. A moment afterwards, there were most awful noises, barking, baying, growls and howls, squealing and groans. And nothing more was ever seen of that foxy whiskered gentleman. Presently, Cap opened the door of the shed and let out Jemima Puddle Duck. Unfortunately, the puppies rushed in and gobbled up all the eggs before he could stop them. He had a bite on his ear, and both the puppies were limping. Jemima Puddle Duck was escorted home in tears, on account of those eggs. She laid some more in June, and she was permitted to keep them herself, but only four of them hatched. And Jemima Puddle Duck said, that it was because of her nerves, but she had always been a bad sitter. The Tale of Mrs. Tiggy Winkle Once upon a time there was a little girl called Lucy, who lived at a farm called Littletown. She was a good little girl only she was always losing her pocket handkerchiefs. One day, little Lucy came into the farmyard crying. Oh, she did cry so. I've lost my pocket hankin, three hankins and a penny. Have you seen them, tabby kitten? The kitten went on washing her white paws, so Lucy asked a speckled hen. Sally Hennypenny, have you found three pocket hankins? But the speckled hen ran into a barn, clucking. I go barefoot, barefoot, barefoot. And then Lucy asked Cock Robin, sitting on a twig. Cock Robin looked sideways at Lucy with his bright black eye, and he flew over a stile and away. Lucy climbed upon the stile and looked up at the hill behind Littletown, a hill that goes up, up into the clouds as though it had no top. And a great way up the hillside, she thought she saw some white things spread upon the grass. Lucy scrambled up the hill as fast as her stout legs would carry her. She ran along a steep pathway, up and up, until Littletown was right away down below. She could have dropped a pebble down the chimney. Presently she came to a spring, bubbling out from the hillside. Someone had stood a tin can upon a stone to catch the water but the water was already running over, for the can was no bigger than an egg cup. And where the sand upon the path was wet, there were footmarks of a very small person. Lucy ran on and on. The path ended under a big rock. 
The grass was short and green, and there were clothes, props cut from bracken stamps, with lines of plaited rushes, and a heap of tiny clothespins, but no pocket handkerchiefs. But there was something else, a door, straight into the hill, and inside it someone was singing. Lily white and clean, oh, with little frills between, oh, smooth and hot, red rusty spot, never here be seen, oh. Lucy knocked, once, twice, and interrupted the song. A little frightened voice called out, Who's that? Lucy opened the door. And what do you think there was inside the hill? A nice clean kitchen with a flagged floor and wooden beams, just like any other farm kitchen. Only the ceiling was so low that Lucy's head nearly touched it, and the pots and pans were small, and so was everything else. There was a nice, hot, singy smell, and at the table, with the iron in her hand, stood a very stout, short person, staring anxiously at Lucy. Her print gown was tucked up, and she was wearing a large apron over her striped petticoat. Her little black nose went sniffle, sniffle, snuffle, and her eyes went twinkle, twinkle, and underneath her cap, where Lucy had yellow curls. That little person had prickles. Who are you? said Lucy. Have you seen my pocket handkins? The little person made a bob curtsy. Oh, yes, if you please him. My name is Mrs. Tiggy Winkle. Oh, yes, if you please him. I'm an excellent clear starcher. Then she took something out of a clothes basket and spread it on the ironing blanket. What's that thing? said Lucy. That's not my pocket hankin. Oh, no, if you please em. That's a little starlet waistcoat belonging to Cock Robin. And she ironed it and folded it and put it on one side. Then she took something else off a cloth horse. That isn't my penny, said Lucy. Oh, no, if you please em. That's a damask tablecloth belonging to Jenny Wren. Look how it's stained with currant wine. It's very bad to wash, said Mrs. Tiggy Winkle. Mrs. Tiggy Winkle's nose went Sniffle, sniffle, snuffle. And her eyes went twinkle, twinkle. And she fetched another hot iron from the fire. There's one of my pocket hankins, cried Lucy. And there's my penny. Mrs. Tiggywinkle ironed it, and goffered it, and shook out the frills. Oh, that is lovely said Lucy. And what are those long yellow things with fingers like gloves? Oh, that's a pair of stockings belonging to Sally Hennypenny. Look how she's worn the heels out with scratching in the yard. She'll very soon go barefoot, said Mrs. Tiggywinkle. Why, there's another handkerchief, but it isn't mine. It's red. Oh, no, if you please em. That one belongs to old Mrs. Rabbit. And it did so smell of onions. I've had to wash it separately. I can't get out the smell. There's another one of mine, said Lucy. What are those funny little white things? That's a pair of mittens belonging to Tabby Kitten. I only have to iron them, she washes them herself. There's my last pocket hankin', said Lucy.
And what are you dipping into the basin of starch? They're little dicky shirt fronts belonging to Tom Titmouse. Most terrible particular, said Mrs. Tiggywinkle. Now I've finished my ironing. I'm going to air some clothes. What are these dear soft fluffy things? said Lucy. Oh, those are woolly coats belonging to the little lambs at Skullgill. Will their jackets take off? asked Lucy. Oh, yes, if you please em. Look at the sheep mark on the shoulder. And here's one marked for Gatesgarth, and three that come from Littletown. They're always marked at washing, said Mrs. Tiggywinkle. And she hung up all sorts of sizes of clothes, small brown coats of mice, and one velvety black moleskin waistcoat, and a red tailcoat with no tail belonging to Squirrel Nutkin, and a very much shrunk blue jacket belonging to Peter Rabbit, and a petticoat not marked that had gone lost in the washing. And at last the basket was empty. Then Mrs. Tiggywinkle made tea, a cup for herself and a cup for Lucy. They sat before the fire on a bench and looked sideways at one another. Mrs. Tiggywinkle's hand holding the teacup was very, very brown and very, very wrinkly with the soap suds and all through her gown and her cap there were hairpins sticking wrong end out, so that Lucy didn't like to sit too near her. When they had finished tea, they tied up the clothes in bundles, and Lucy's pocket handkerchiefs were folded up inside a clean penny, and fastened with a silver safety pin. And then they made up the fire with turf, and came out and locked the door, and hid the key under the door sill. Then away down the hill trotted Lucy and Mrs. Tiggywinkle, with the bundles of clothes. All the way down the path little animals came out of the fern to meet them. The very first that they met were Peter Rabbit and Benjamin Bunny, and she gave them their nice clean clothes and all the little animals and birds were so very obliged to dear Mrs. Tiggywinkle, so that at the bottom of the hill, when they came to the stile, there was nothing left to carry except Lucy's one little bundle. Lucy scrambled up the stile with the bundle in her hand, and then she turned to say good night and to thank the washerwoman. But what a very odd thing! Mrs. Tiggywinkle had not waited either for thanks or for the washing bell. She was running, running, running up the hill. And where was her white frilly cap, and her shawl, and her gown, and her petticoat? And how small she had grown, and how brown, and covered with prickles. Why, Mrs. Tiggywinkle was nothing but a hedgehog. Now, some people say that little Lucy had been asleep upon the stile. But then, how could she have found three clean pocket hankins, and a penny, pinned with a silver safety pin? And besides, I have seen that door into the back of the hill called Catbells. And besides, I am very well acquainted with dear Mrs. Tiggywinkle. The Tale of Mr. Jeremy Fisher Once upon a time there was a frog called Mr. Jeremy Fisher. He lived in a little damp house amongst the buttercups at the edge of a pond. The water was all slippy-sloppy in the larder 
and in the back passage. But Mr. Jeremy liked getting his feet wet. Nobody ever scolded him, and he never caught a cold. He was quite pleased when he looked out and saw large drops of rain splashing in the pond. I will get some worms and go fishing and catch a dish of minnows for my dinner, said Mr. Jeremy Fisher. If I catch more than five fish, I will invite my friends, Mr. Alderman Ptolemy Tortoise, and Sir Isaac Newton. The Alderman, however, eats salad. Mr. Jeremy put on a Macintosh and a pair of shiny galoshes. He took his rod and basket and set off with enormous hops to the place where he kept his boat. The boat was round and green, and very like the other lily leaves. It was tied to a water plant in the middle of the pond. Mr. Jeremy took a reed pole and pushed the boat out into open water. I know a good place for minnows, said Mr. Jeremy Fisher. Mr. Jeremy stuck his pole into the mud and fastened the boat to it. Then he settled himself cross-legged and arranged his fishing tackle. He had the dearest little red float. His rod was a tough stalk of grass. His line was a fine, long white horsehair. And he tied a little wriggling worm at the end. The rain trickled down his back, and for nearly an hour he stared at the float. This is getting tiresome. I think I should like some lunch, said Mr. Jeremy Fisher. He punted back again amongst the water plants and took some lunch out of his basket. I will eat a butterfly sandwich and wait till the shower is over, said Mr. Jeremy Fisher. A great big water beetle came up beneath the lily leaf and tweaked the toe of one of his galoshes. Mr. Jeremy crossed his legs up shorter, out of reach, and went on eating his sandwich. Once or twice something moved about with a rustle and a splash amongst the rushes at the side of the pond. I trust that is not a rat, said Mr. Jeremy Fisher. I think I had better get away from here. Mr. Jeremy shoved the boat out again a little way, and dropped in the bait. There was a bite almost directly. The float gave a tremendous bobbit. A minnow, a minnow, I have him by the nose, cried Mr. Jeremy Fisher jerking up his rod. But what a horrible surprise! Instead of a smooth, fat minnow, Mr. Jeremy landed little Jack Sharp, the stickleback covered with spines. The stickleback floundered about the boat, cracking and snapping until he was quite out of breath. Then he jumped back into the water and a shoal of other little fishes put their heads out and laughed at Mr. Jeremy Fisher. And while Mr. Jeremy sat disconsolately on the edge of his boat, sucking his sore fingers and peering down into the water, a much worse thing happened. A really frightful thing it would have been if Mr. Jeremy had not been wearing a Macintosh. A great big, enormous trout came up, ker-flop, pop, 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 with a splash. And it seized Mr. Jeremy with a snap. Ow, ow, ow! And then it turned and dived down to the bottom of the pond. But the trout was so displeased with the taste of the Macintosh that in less than half a minute it spat him out again. 
and the only thing it swallowed was Mr. Jeremy's galoshes. Mr. Jeremy bounced up to the surface of the water, like a cork, and the bubbles out of a soda water bottle. And he swam with all his might to the edge of the pond. He scrambled out on the first bank he came to, and he hopped home across the meadow with his Macintosh all in tatters. What a mercy that was not a pike, said Mr. Jeremy Fisher. I have lost my rod and basket, but it does not much matter, for I am sure I should never have dared to go fishing again. He put some sticking plaster on his fingers, and his friends both came to dinner. He could not offer them fish, but he had something else in his larder. Sir Isaac Newton wore his black and gold waistcoat, and Mr. Alderman Ptolemy Tortoise brought a salad with him in a string bag. And instead of a nice dish of minnows, they had a roasted grasshopper with ladybird sauce, which frogs consider a beautiful treat. But I think it must have been nasty.